right. All right, uh, I see that uh, our participants are filing in. So uh, I wanna thank people for attending. I'll give people a few seconds here to uh, get on the call. Uh, this uh, is our panel on building a pro-worker anti-monopoly movement. Uh, I wanna thank the Open Markets Institute, Change to Win, uh, United for Respect, uh, for all joining us here. Uh, my name is David Dayan. I am the executive editor of the American Prospect. I'm going to be moderating uh, this panel today. Uh, I will introduce our, our other uh, folks here uh, as, as I bring them up. Um, uh, I guess I will start by saying I want to uh, apologize for any uh, changes in the sound quality here. Uh, I am about, uh, I think, three blocks from a, uh, a protest site that's going on uh, since eight o'clock this morning. There have been helicopters overhead for several hours. And um, uh, the National Guard was uh, actually stationed at uh, this area, uh, just a few blocks from my house last night and uh, continues to be there. Um, I think this is an opportune uh, moment uh, yeah, as we see the ravages of this global pandemic and also the uh, uh, civil unrest from uh, the death of George Floyd, uh, to be talking about this topic. Uh, we have uh, essentially uh, the, the U.S. military in conjunction uh, with uh, a militarized police force uh, on uh, a, a, a street just blocks from my house, which is a, an upscale shopping center street uh, there to protect the property of uh, a very large and important uh, uh, business outlets, uh, chains of uh, major stores. And uh, this, uh, you know, there's, there's an imagery here of, of how this connects to the ways in which national power has been put to bear to uh, protect and advance the interests of a very small group of corporations uh, over the rest of us uh, as we uh, struggle to have our voices heard. And uh, they're, they're, to me, obviously, uh, the, the, the protest movement that's going on is a movement for black lives and uh, is, is tied up with the issue of police brutality and, and violence against, against African Americans and people of color. Uh, but I don't think it can be disassociated with the essential sort of breakage in the social contract, the uh, fact that individuals uh, feel very little agency uh, to, to affect change uh, in, in America and even to live their own lives uh, and, and to prosper and thrive, uh, given that uh, so much of the gains and the productivity in our economy has, has funneled up to uh, a small group at the top. And, and so uh, uh, this, this, this maybe, uh, this, this seminar, this webinar seems, seems maybe off topic at the moment, but I think it's actually perfectly on topic. Uh, uh, this is uh, the kinds of things that we should be thinking about and talking about and discussing. And we have a great panel to do that today. So uh, we're gonna have each panelist talk for a few minutes uh, about this whole concept of building a pro-worker anti-monopoly movement. And uh, after that, well, I will uh, bring in a, a discussion, uh, ask some questions, and then we will have some time at the end for a Q&A from the audience. You can get involved uh, through uh, uh, the Q&A section of Zoom by raising your hand, uh, asking a question there, uh, get involved on the chat, however you want to participate. So I want to start uh, with Courtney Brown, who uh, is a worker at uh, an Amazon Fresh, basically a, a grocery store in uh, New Jersey. And she's here to tell us about her experiences working for uh, one of the largest corporations in the world. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, what, what, what that has meant during this pandemic and, and even more generally. So Courtney, uh, take it away. 
Hi, uh, everyone. My name is Courtney Brown. Um, I work at EWR6 in Avenel, New Jersey. We're for Fulfillment Center. It's uh, fresh. We are, it's literally a, bigger than a football field, and it's a giant supermarket. Um, I've been with them for, um, for almost three years now, come August, me and my sister. Uh, we pretty much aren't treated as uh, human beings here. Uh, working for them, we are literally considered robots. It's all about numbers and the way that they, you know, uh, jeopardize our safety is a big impact on that. Uh, I remember one time, uh, two years ago, there was one of the new employees, she had only been here a few months, where she was actually having, I think it was a stroke, and their immediate reaction was to just like, okay, well, are you, you know, on something? Are you sick? Like, did you, uh, did you take something? Like, they thought she took, you know, she was, she had some drugs or something, and no one wanted to call nine one one. They just wanted to sit her down and give her water, but she couldn't, eat, she couldn't speak and she couldn't move part of her body. And so I immediately walked to the front, called nine one one, and I told security what was going on. And it turns out she did have, I, I'm not sure if, which one it was, a stroke or a heart attack. But um, she literally actually almost died. If I didn't call 911, she would have actually passed away. And when she came back a few months later, it was to literally just work for a pay period to get a paycheck and then put in her two weeks. I confronted her about, you know, uh, probably taking legal action against them. And one of the first things that came out of her mouth was, one, she doesn't have the money to do that. And two, they have all the money in the world to literally just, you know, pretty much bury her. That's it. You know, she can't fight back against someone, you know, that literally almost killed her. And she's not the only one that something like that has happened to myself and friends and even my sister as well. They literally have their own little, you know, fake nurse area for us called AmCare. And working for them, I get to see a lot of like, you know, good, bad and extremely bad you know, being how, you know, they go about doing business. When I first started with them, I got to actually, I came in when there was talks of cutting out UPS and USPS. So, you know, like I got to see that whole transition, what happened. Like USPS was pretty much, they hired an influx of people because they needed delivery drivers. And once Amazon terminated that contract with them, all of those jobs went. My post office here in my neighborhood went from being packed to only having like three people and a supervisor every day, you know? Um, same thing with UPS. In a lot of areas, they don't use them anymore either. They completely stop. Um, and it goes to the same thing. Even with our truck drivers now, the way that they conduct, you know, business with them, they do it kind of like an auction. Whoever can, you know, will take the lowest fee, that's who they'll take, which that in turn pay you know those drivers even less for working crazy amounts of hours i've seen drivers literally work almost a full day just to try and make decent amount of money and then now the talk is to actually have our own drivers and pay them even less than what they're making you know uh just so that a way they don't have to pay anyone else a large amount of money so they've literally changed the game and how everyone you know conducts business so you know, right now during the pandemic, everyone is, you know, at home, everyone's scared and no one, you know, wants to go anywhere. So everyone's ordering everything online. They have their own furniture, their own groceries, egg, from eggs to bread to diapers, everything. They have it. And we're starting to see more of that stuff being, you know, held in these warehouses versus everything else. So everything else is being pushed out, you know, and the way that they're, uh, treating us right now, especially during the pandemic, that shows how, you know, it's literally all numbers. They bypass everything so that way they can push out as much as possible. You know, and I see that every day where I work, because I work ship dock and I ship out everything that goes to New York City. And it's all about, okay, well, if we, you know, get rid of social distancing, then we can push out three or four times the amount of orders in, you know, just a 11-hour a shift, you know? And it's important to actually split up this type of company that's literally so big that they have people scared to even speak up against them when, you know, there's people that have literally died 
we've had workers that have died during the pandemic because of it and before, you know? So all of this literally just breeds fear and people that are too scared, too terrified to speak up because they'll lose their livelihood. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much for that testimony, uh, uh, Courtney. I appreciate it. Um, uh, we're going to go right now to uh, Andrea Dellendorf, who is the co-director of United for Respect, which is a coalition of uh, retail workers, including Amazon workers, uh, and you can talk about uh, what you're what you're doing on this front. So, Andrea, go ahead. Great. So I have the privilege of working with Courtney and others and um, to really build a worker movement that is taking on Amazon's dominance and monopoly power. And I think Courtney really laid it out very clearly that this is actually a very simple thing. When a company or corporation has this kind of monopolistic power and dominance over the supply chain, over our society, over all the goods and services that we do, it can't but impact um, the ability of any individual working person or who works there or within the, um, the broader supply chain to make a difference and really be able to make change. And historically, you know, unions have really played um, what this, have played this role of being a check and balance against outsized corporate power. But we need to understand that, you know, with the declining power of unions, there really isn't this bottom up check and balance around these corporations and monopolies. And workers at Amazon and others have been taking incredibly courageous action um, to speak out. Um, and they have just been absolutely ruthless in their response. And if we can imagine that, you know, one person whose life was almost taken from them by the management's action, you know, that this is 600,000 people who are going through this and a much larger number when you look overall um, at the amount of jobs that are directly tied um, to Amazon and that we really need new and vibrant worker movements to really regulate from below and hold them accountable. Um, you know, we're, you know, we work with a set of groups as part of Athena that is really bringing together both worker organizations and workers um, and uh, customers and people who work in the supply chain and small business folks and people who care about the impacts on the communities and it really is this whole kind of ecosystem of work that has to happen in order to hold them accountable but the role of workers is so so central because on the deep human level they are the ones that that are on the front lines they see what's happening they see under the hood and having them be at the lead and really changing and framing what we expect of these monopolies is really, really critical to moving forward. So i um, excited to, to share more in the Q&A and thank you so much, Courtney, for sharing your experience. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Emma Rebhorn now. She's the Assistant General Counsel with Change to Win, which is a, a labor organization and maybe she should talk about, uh, uh, you know, how that works uh, with, within organized labor at this point and this, this issue. Sure. Um, thanks. So, uh, so when we were preparing for this panel, Sandeep, you said something that struck me uh, it's definitely true. And I thought it was elegantly put that um, in the antitrust space, oftentimes firms are just workers with a little bit of property. Um, so Court, Courtney, you articulated really how really movingly um, how Amazon's dominance has affected your life um, as its direct employee. Um, and uh, we actually, we recently uh, petitioned the FTC to investigate how Amazon's dominance has, um, is also affecting the lives of its delivery drivers and its third party sellers who are producing a profit for Amazon, but bearing all the risk of their enterprises themselves. Um, and the second, the, the same pattern is evident in a second change to win campaign that I'll, that I'm gonna discuss briefly today. Um, and that's the campaign to organize port truck drivers. Um, and I mention it because it really, it illustrates the long reach of antitrust um, and anti-monopoly, the absence of that enforcement sometimes or its overzealousness um, to touch many kinds of workers and firms. Um, so port truck drivers quickly are, um, are the truck drivers who transport imported goods from big container ships to warehouses um, for, and these are products owned by Trader Joe's or maybe Amazon. The majority of these drivers are misclassified as independent contractors, which we see increasingly everywhere. Um, and they make barely a living wage after deducting 
for um, expenses. And like Amazon sellers and Amazon delivery drivers um, who are tied to Amazon through merchandise-based cash advances and vehicle leases, port truck drivers are, um, through leases on their trucks, are tied to the companies who are setting their prices for their services but have, um, have so far escaped any, um, any real antitrust scrutiny. Um, and so I mention this especially because it's not only that in antitrust enforcement has turned a blind eye to, um, to this industry, but that it's, actually, it's affirmatively exacerbated um, the inequalities in power in these relationships. Um, a little more than 20 years ago, port truck drivers had engaged in a wave of strikes across the country, Baltimore, Savannah, um, Seattle, and um, they, were, they were demanding what you'd expect, a little better than the minimum wage and maximum risk that, uh, that generally characterizes their work. And in response, the FTC announced that announced a nationwide investigation into the drivers uh, for um, unfair methods of competitive pricing. So workers going on strike was an unfair method of competition. Um, and as it happened, incidentally, in the same week in 1999, when the FTC approved the merger of Exxon and Mobil, it issued three subpoenas to individual truck drivers um, to investigate their role in this organizing campaign. Um, these were workers who, as I mentioned, didn't even own their trucks, they leased them from their employers. Um, so these were, uh, these were firms uh, of workers with very little property. Um, the FTC investigation closed with no action, and um, we think there would have been no merit to such an action. It's definitely not supported in legislative history. But the fact that the investigation happened and that the subpoenas were issued to these drivers illustrates the need for reform here. Um, and it's been a long-standing need that fortunately a movement is really coalescing around now. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the fact is that antitrust enforcement has posed more of a threat to uh, working people than to uh, the dominant companies that they work for, whether they're these port trucking companies or most acutely Amazon. Um, we're hoping that the investigation we asked the FTC to engage in will be a chance for the agency to get it right this time. Thank you, Emma. And uh, I've been down at the Port of Los Angeles and I've talked to uh, port workers and, uh, you know, they're, that's as much a monopoly on the local level as we see with Amazon on the national level. So uh, thank you for your work. Uh, I want to go to uh, Brian Kalachi. Uh, he, he is a postdoctoral scholar uh, with data and society. I know he's written a lot about uh, worker safety, uh, workplace safety and antitrust. And so uh, he has a lot to bear on this, this issue. So Brian, uh, if you can make some remarks. Sure. Um, so I think what I'll talk about is um, why, uh, why I think that there isn't more anti-monopolism in the modern labor movement uh, yet. Uh, we're getting there, thanks to the efforts of some folks on this call. I think it's because of something called, uh, we have in economics, we call the large firm wage premium which is it used to be true that you were substantially better off as a worker if you worked at a big company relative to a small company. And there were a few reasons for this, but one of the big ones is that uh, the big post-war breakthrough of American uh, labor unions was in concentrated industries like steel, auto, chemicals, uh, telecommunications. Um, and so in these large firms that had some monopoly pricing power, the ability to raise prices, uh, strong labor unions, when they were backed by the power of the federal government in uh, you know, World War II, uh, created the possibility for those profits to be shared with workers. Um, now, there were three problems with that arrangement. Uh, the first one is that it never covered more than minority of workers. Uh, so outside the monopolistic basic industries, uh, where workers were, were mostly white men, uh, unions never really got much of a foothold. So industries like laundries, agriculture, textiles, car washes, domestic work, retail, uh, food processing, uh, these are industries with smaller firms um, and, and the workers tended much more likely to be women and people of color. Uh, so this week um, and every week, uh, but this week especially, that kind of compromise where a handful of uh, mostly white men get taken care of to the exclusion of everybody else, uh, especially black people, is a part of upholding white supremacy and is not good. Uh, second, the second reason why that, 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 um, that, that sort of uh, large word wage uh, premium sort of fell apart um, was that, as Andrea alluded to, uh, worker power has declined quite a bit. 
Um, and in fact, empirically, we know that the large firm premium uh, is about half of what it used to be since 1980. It's just collapsed. There's no longer as much of a premium for being a worker at a large firm. And then third, finally, even within monopolized industries, companies immediately uh, started outsourcing and franchising and subcontracting to get around union contracts. So uh, uh, it's now sort of forgotten, but General Motors started outsourcing parts manufacturing in the 50s and 60s. Um, the United Auto Workers, the union in that industry, um, actually went out and organized the parts plants, but GM had so much power over the suppliers. They were able to squeeze down the prices those suppliers were able to charge, uh, uh, ratchet down their profit margins, that the UAW was completely unable to impose union wage scales on the parts suppliers and eventually abandoned the effort uh, to represent those workers. Um, so the UIW actually ran a public anti-monopsony, that's sort of the opposite of monopsony when you have a large buyer. Uh, they ran an anti-monopsony campaign in the 1960s trying to get antitrust enforcement against automakers. Um, so, um, so we see this, that, that kind of outsourcing um, is rampant across the economy now. Uh, airlines outsource everything but flying the plane basically these days. Uh, and they even outsource flying the plane a lot of the times, so these regional airlines with lower profits and lower uh, pay scales. Um, I've just uh, sort of talked about airlines and, and part suppliers, but there's other kinds of monopoly power where workers at distributors and franchisees face similar problems where just for example, uh, McDonald's completely dominates its small business franchisees who actually operate the restaurants uh, through both its market power and highly restrictive contracts that basically minimize worker wages by co controlling everything but wages so that the franchisees who manage the restaurants or the uh, Jiffy Lube or whatever it is, they make their margins on labor costs. That's what, that's what they're supposed to do. Um, so it, it has changes in antitrust law in the 1970s, lobbied for by these corporations themselves that allowed McDonald's to impose those kinds of contracts in the first place. It used to be illegal. And that same kind of uh, restrictive contract is now what Uber and Lyft use to control their drivers without formally employing them. Um, so you can see, you know, when you look back in history and you know, sort of like the good old days, the heyday of, of, of high wages in America, uh, you might want to think, uh, you, might, you might not look too harshly on monopoly, um, but the good old days, I would just close by saying they were never that great to begin with, and they're over anyway. Um, so it's really time to look at anti-monopoly in, in a new light and try to find some ways to, to bring these cor cor corporations back to the power of the public and social control. All right. Thank you, Brian. Um, uh, we're going to wrap up with uh, Sandeep Vahisen, uh, who's the legal director of the Open Markets Institute uh, and has done significant work on this issue, particularly around monopsony, uh, which is the ways in which workers are squeezed uh, through the power of large firms. So uh, Sandeep, take it away. Great. Thanks, David. So I'll offer sort of a pro-worker antitrust agenda at a high level. Uh, so I'd like to start with some basic philosophical points and something Emma mentioned. We don't just need more antitrust and more competition across the board. We need more antitrust in certain places and then decidedly less antitrust in others. And the reality is today that antitrust law and enforcement do very little to protect workers and a great deal to affirmatively hurt them. Um, so we really need to confront the perverse interpretations and applications of antitrust. Uh, we need to directly challenge the dominant consumer welfare philosophy, reject it, and in its place adopt a philosophy that constrains and controls corporate power broadly. Uh, so in short, we really need a 180 degree reorientation of the field, not just tweaks at the margins. So what are some specifics that can be done to protect workers? So we'll start with some low hanging fruit. I mean, at a basic level, the antitrust agencies should be going hard after restraints on employer competition for workers and restraints on worker mobility. So wage fixing and no poach agreements among employers are already categorically illegal. We just need the DOJ and FTC to fully prosecute these violations by employers. Second, non-compete clauses. These are everywhere in the economy about as many as 60 million workers are bound by them. These prevent workers from going where they want after leaving a job or even starting their own business. The FTC has clear authority to ban these coercive contracts and OMI, United for Respect, SCIU, and a broad labor and public interest coalition petitioned the FTC to do exactly this last year. Second, the DOJ and the FTC have to take labor market concentration seriously. When they review a merger, they should look at not only product market effects, but labor market effects, and be prepared to stop mergers that further concentrate 
labor markets, which in many parts of the country are already highly concentrated. Uh, this is an especially severe problem in rural areas. Third, this touches on Brian's research. The antitrust authorities have to restrict certain business models. Uh, thanks to changes in antitrust law since the 1970s, we have a system of control without responsibility for the most powerful entities in our economy. So as Brian mentioned, franchisors ex exert tight control over their franchisees and effectively give franchisees one way of succeeding and thriving, maintaining a model built on low wages and high worker turnover. So antitrust has to take vertical restraints and the system of control without responsibility seriously as it did through the late 1970s. I think the second part is antitrust has to really be pulled back in important areas. As Emma mentioned, you know, the FTC has chilled the organizing efforts of independent contractors and professionals. So the pork truck drivers are one example. Other examples of workers who've been targeted include electricians, ice skating coaches, organists, music teachers. So if you're outside the traditional employment relationship, you're out of luck if you want to band together with your colleagues and build power. Uh, so Uber nicely illustrates the perversity of this current system. You know, Uber and Lyft drivers cannot band together because they are independent contractors. And so they have to face this, these giant VC backed entities on an individual atomized basis. Uh, same story for Amazon sellers and their delivery firms. And as the gig economy grows, as it surely will after this crisis, you know, more and more workers will not have the legal right to organize and will actually be committing an antitrust violation if they do. So we really need to invert how we do antitrust. Unfortunately, we do have models of promoting co coordination among small players in the economy. So for instance, the Capra Volstead Act protects cooperation among farmers and ranchers, allows them to build collective power and even start their own cooperative enterprises. So we have legislative precedents on which we should build and generalize. Um, so I'll wrap by saying that we absolutely need Congress to act to protect the freedom of association for workers, professionals, and small firms in our economy. Uh, without legislation, they simply cannot exercise their basic rights without taking extraordinary legal risk. Uh, but all that said, the DOJ and the FTC have significant legal precedents and powers to use and can do a lot to free workers from oppressive contracts and concentrated labor markets. Uh, we just need good leadership in charge of both agencies. So personnel is policy, and I think it's especially true for labor antitrust. Great, great. Uh, thank you, Sandeep, and thank you to all of our, our panelists. Uh, we have a lot of you, so I'm going to be uh, going around trying to reach everybody. Um, uh, we already have a lot of questions in the Q&A, and frankly, I, I want to go to them. Um, so uh, the first question here was uh, from an anonymous attendee for, for Courtney. Uh, and it speaks to what Sandeep was talking about around uh, non-competes and just, just the monopsony in general, how, how fewer uh, uh, opportunities for workers uh, affects uh, the labor market and affects workers in general. So the question was, you know, uh, can you share a bit about the other employment opportunities in your area other than Amazon and uh, how that affects you know, uh, everything about what Amazon is doing in terms of their work conditions and, and, and benefits and things like that uh, because of uh, what, what could be limited opportunities for you to find employment elsewhere. Okay, so basically, uh, I live in Newark, New Jersey. So Amazon actually employs a lot of people from areas like Newark, Elizabeth, and Linden, where the population is mostly Latino and you know, uh, black or any kind of minority really. So in our area is really just a lot of small businesses. And then you have places like McDonald's, you have Home Depot, you have, uh, you know, the two malls, Short Hills Mall and Livingston Mall is like 30 minutes away. And so smaller businesses don't really have, you know, really any job spots. A lot of them can just be run with the owner or like, you know, maybe one other person that they hire. So that's not really, you know, a place that a lot of us go to look for work unless we actually see them with a, you know, help wanted sign. So a lot of us go to Home Depot, McDonald's and stuff like that. I remember I used to work for Macy's 
Uh, my sister, she actually worked for Home Depot before we worked for Amazon. They promised her 40 hours a week, and she was actually doing less than 20. And she was bringing home maybe 100 and something dollars. And me at Macy's, I was literally working six days a week trying to, you know, sneak around and stay after my initial, like, eight- or nine-hour shift was done just to get a little bit of extra time, Mm -hmm. you know? So Amazon pays more than a lot of these places. A lot of these places don't pay a living wage. Like, getting paid $9 or $10 an hour is not a living wage out here, especially if you're trying to find a home. We literally had to live in our car for six weeks in order to, you know, save up. My other sister, she was living with us at the time, and she was working, um, I think it was at, like, a sneaker store or something. And she was only making $10 an hour. And it took us, you know, living six weeks in a car to try and scramble some money together. And we found, you know, a landlord, like, that I literally had to beg for those entire six weeks to rent for us, you know, to rent to us. Mm -hmm. you know and then working for amazon we made a couple of dollars more which what at the time it was like 13 which made it a little you know better but not necessarily better because we then ended up homeless again because where we were living at you know uh it was deemed unlivable by a judge so we ended up homeless again and at that time we didn't even make enough for you know other places to go okay well you make enough for you to pay rent and everything you know So thank God I was a veteran, so I was able to actually receive some help. But there's really no opportunities over here other than Amazon, you know, that pays $15 an hour. So everybody is really desperate, you know, and willing to risk their lives just to, you know, try and provide for their family. Right. So so that's sort of the textbook kind of real world implication of monopsony. So so this is somebody with no with with few other outcomes, three other options, and then has to endure whatever it is that that large firm wants to throw at them. So thank you for that. Um, uh, So we we should probably talk in uh, the context of the coronavirus crisis. Uh, I have a a question from an attendee uh, saying, you know, I've heard that recovering from the pandemic will enable big companies to further grab market share uh, when smaller businesses fail or are slower in recovering. Uh, what's your sense of that? And is, is, is there uh, possibilities for alternative arrangements? I'll just say briefly that we know that, for example, the CARES Act, uh, when, when you look at the money that was distributed from Congress, uh, you had uh, this, these small business loans that last eight weeks long and then you had a $4.5 trillion set of credit facilities that are put together at the Federal Reserve for larger firms. Uh, the, the, if you look at the dollar amounts, it's about a six to one relationship, six to seven to one between uh, what, what large firms are getting and what small firms are getting. And of course, large firms are better equipped with reserves to endure uh, the effects of a, a large crisis. So. Um, just on that alone, I would say uh, that this is this is a reality that's coming. But if anybody else uh, wants to take that, perhaps Andeep. Sure. Yes, yeah, so I think our crisis conditions are sort of setting the stage for another round of large-scale consolidation. Because as you mentioned, we have millions of distressed small and medium-sized businesses on one hand, and a handful of large, powerful, and very secure businesses on the other. And that combination means that we're likely going to see a lot more M&A in the next six months, next one year. And we're already seeing early signs of it with Uber proposing to buy Grubhub, Amazon rumored to be buying AMC, then Facebook bought Giphy. I think these are just the very early stages. And, you know, the CARES Act shows that there is another way. We don't need to save businesses through consolidation. We can actually provide them public support to endure the systemic crisis. And implementation is really key. We shouldn't give up on the CARES Act approach because it's been poorly implemented. We should really call for better administration so that businesses and their workers can weather this storm. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Yeah, I I believe I read a stat that big tech is doing as many acquisitions now as they have in, in any point in the last five years. So uh, that just gives you a flavor of that. Um, Emma, I have, I have a question here uh, from uh, Seth 
Friedman, who's uh, uh, on the, uh, the participating here. Uh, do you believe that workers in these huge corporations will be protected physically and financially if they strike? Is there a supportive infrastructure being built? As we know, we've seen actions, uh, over 150 of them or more, uh, at places like Amazon, uh, which don't have uh, uh, union representation, other, other firms uh, that might, um, protesting workplace conditions, protesting uh, uh, the, the, the need to come back uh, and reopen given the, the uh, public health environment. Um, what are we thinking around uh, uh, the, the, you know, the protections that we need in place uh, in, in the event that there are uh, unsafe environments uh, to come back to? Well, as Amazon workers have shown us so admirably in the last two months, um, that it's, it's that the question of whether you have a legal right to strike is irrelevant when you have the power to strike um, and when you're well organized. Uh, so that's my that's my first answer, um, and I and I I imagine that we'll see more of that as as um, the kind of the circumstances that Courtney talks about become more and more extreme. Um, and more widespread as Amazon does consolidate um, its role as an employer as jobs that were already absent from a lot of our cities and certainly rural areas um, become even scarcer post pandemic and during the pandemic. Um, the question also, I'm not sure if it was answered by what I mentioned about, the, about port truck drivers, but one of the consequences of the, the trend, the many years long trend in this country of classifying workers as independent contractors is that um, not only do they gain legal exposure under antitrust law, um, they lose affirmative organizing rights under, under federal law, under the National Labor Relations Act. Um, sure. So, uh, so there's, you know, there's one practical answer and it's about power, but then there's another answer and it's about the law. Um, and it's not a good one. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we're gonna need both uh, to, to move forward. Um, this, is a, this is a great question from R. Dennis Olson, and it, it, I think Andrea is best uh, equipped to answer that. You know, we talk about, um, you know, the, the, the situation for workers sort of at the consumer facing part of the chain uh, with respect to Amazon, Walmart, and these big corporations, but there's also stuff happening, you know, to up up the the, the chain in terms of vertical combination. Uh, this this uh, individual asks, uh, can you comment on the ramifications of Walmart buying its own dairy processing plant and beef packing plant and become completely vertically integrated? Uh, uh, Costco and some other uh, large retailers uh, that are also groceries have done the same. Um, uh, talk about you know uh, how this is this is not limited to a retail worker uh, situation. It, it goes uh, completely throughout uh, every part of the supply chain. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I want to make that general point that I think sometimes we think about workers and we're thinking about them within this one corporation and the power that they have. But really, from what Courtney said and shared, it is a much broader universe of jobs that are all dependent on an increasingly concentrated set of corporations, and both directly because they are the um, that you know they are ultimately the where the money is coming from to pay for those workers, and that because they're employing these subcontractors or these acquisitions, that they're able to squeeze the rates putting downward pressure on wages, but then what it also does is reverberates even more broadly, which that with then meaning that every other industry that is competing to sell those products or to offer those services are having to compete for a company that's doing it at lower rate, which is then systematically depressing wages and benefits across the entire economy. And you know, we really saw this with Walmart when they were growing and expanding their power and their dominance over the market, that all of a sudden these, you know, these union contracts that had you know, taken decades to win and secure good wages and benefits suddenly were on the defense having to negotiate to hold on to those because of the competitive advantage. So, you know, we're really looking at people who are directly working, people who are working for, you know, for um, subsidiary or contracted entities or those who are competing. Um, and it really becomes 
everybody's jobs, everybody's wages, everybody's benefits are all being systematically depressed because of the monopoly power of these uh, concentrated corporations. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Brian for this because I, I know you've written about uh, worker safety. You've also written about uh, for for the prospect about hazard pay and uh, how how um, you know that that may not be enough when you're talking about uh, you know, conditions of, of where uh, people have to work during this crisis. Um, so Anton Hajar says, uh, you know, the NLRA protects the right of workers to engage in concerted activities. Are there cases? He's asking about pending cases challenging retaliation and 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 uh, and and those who uh, you know might think working conditions are unsafe. Uh, but maybe talk about sort of the broad scope of of uh, worker safety laws, uh, what worker rights are around that, and uh, and and how hazard pay is is maybe not enough. Yeah, sure. Um, so. Uh... Uh, so I think the best way to, to address that is sort of contrast what happened in uh, in France with what happened in the U.S. Uh, there was a there, there were basically um, workers in, in Amazon identified a safety hazard that they are equipped workers are the best equipped to, to, to equipped to identify when their workplace is unsafe, uh, and they just shut it down. Uh, they have the power through the collective bargaining agreement to say we're not going to work under these under these unsafe conditions. They have a, a, a health and safety committee that's empowered by a law to refuse unsafe work. Uh, in the U.S., I think just re re sort of reflecting the, the less uh, powerful bargaining position of many workers, the demand has been hazard pay, which is absolutely, um, it, it, it's crucial, but I think what it really represents is, 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 is uh, a, a recognition that these jobs have not been social valued even before the pandemic. Uh, no one should be making uh, 12, 13, uh, even 15 bucks an hour. Um, so so I, I think a lot of the demand for hazard pay sort of reflects this um, recognition that a lot of jobs that we have not been socially valued and paying appropriately should, when the pandemic goes away, those wages should not come back down for, because of a temporary hazard pay uh, situation. They, the wages should stay high permanently. But also hazard pay really makes uh, health and safety professionals nervous because it's an incentive to go to work. So, you know, those outbreaks in the meatpacking plants, uh, a temporary, they had, they, get, they called it a responsibility bonus. So they, they didn't guard the machine, they didn't distance the workstations, they didn't give workers adequate PPE, they didn't structurally separate the workstations, they didn't slow down the lines. All they did was say, we'll pay you extra so you can come in. And that is, in economics, it's, it's a theory called compensating differentials, which basically puts the responsibility for safety on workers rather than the employer where it belongs. So it's it basically what it, what it says is, well, you've accepted the hazard pay, you knew it was an unsafe workplace, now it's on you. And we've, we've compensated you for the risk, and if anything happens to you, well, we're sorry, but that well, we've paid you for the risk. So, so uh, what, what, I think I'll just contrast that again with the French case where workers are already getting paid high wages, and they were able through, through, uh, through the, the power they have through their, through their union to, um, to, shut, to refuse unsafe work. Uh, finally, just very briefly, uh, in the US context, under the Taft-Hartley Act um, and under OSHA, there are rights to refuse unsafe work. They are limited and poorly enforced, but workers should do it anyway. Um, we, need to, you know, we need to push those boundaries of the law a little bit further. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, no one should have to go to an unsafe workplace, no matter what the wage is, and workers in, the, in these essential jobs should, should see big raises that are permanent. Thank you. Um, so uh, the, the name of this, this panel is Building an, uh, a Pro-Worker Anti-Monopoly Movement. And I'm curious as to thoughts uh, from the panelists about how we go about doing that. So uh, this, this uh, crisis has, has seen, has it has raised the potential, I think, for that. It's created a moment where suddenly workers who were making very low wages are called essential. Uh, where there's a lot of uh, solidarity and uh, sympathy for uh, those who are on the front lines of this. Um, but th it's sort of inchoate. There's, there's these very random actions that are going on across the country. But uh, the, the question is how to build that into something that is sustainable and sustained uh, in order to uh, fight what is going to be growing power uh, from large firms who are probably going to get larger in the wake of this crisis. So uh, maybe from the perspective of uh, some of the organizers uh, on this, uh, uh, Emma, Andrea, even Courtney, uh, uh, maybe talk about, you know, your thoughts on, on how to actually build this movement. 
Well, why don't I offer to just kick us off and then would love to, to hear from Courtney and Emma on this. So, so I would say that, you know, I actually disagree. I, you know, these are not kind of inchoate actions that are moving around. Like there actually, you know, is a, you know, a principled um, sort of movement ecosystem. And so it feels different from a typical, there's sort of one organization that's running, you know, that's supporting workers on taking action. But it really rather is an understanding that if we are gonna fundamentally change Amazon, workers have got to be at the forefront on pushing and moving the accountability because we need that to win. And if I was an anti-monopoly, you know, if my core focus was anti-monopoly, I would want to have Courtney and her coworkers part of that fight, right? Because that's how we're, it's going to, that's how we're going to hold them accountable, build power within it. And I think if we're going to really seriously win for workers, we have got to have an anti-monopoly and Courtney can talk, Courtney can talk about this around, like we have to tear them down and break them apart to really have real power and respect and humanization of the people who are um, who are doing the work. But what I think is really exciting about the movement is it's really recognizing that there is a role for formal unions. There is a role for you know in the, you know a group of workers who just want to take action on their own. There is a role for um, for organizations like ours or for incredible movement groups like the Awood Center in Minnesota or um, you know or the Warehouse Worker Resource Center in Southern California. You know, and so it's really about fitting all of this together to show that there is this very broad and vast community and ecosystem of folks that are leading this charge. Um, and it doesn't look and feel like a traditional campaign because it, it is coming from everywhere, um, but it's all building towards this bigger intervention. Great. Uh, Emma, did you have some, some thoughts on that or Courtney? Um, well, Courtney, I don't know. Do you, wanna, do you wanna build on what Andrea said about breaking up Amazon? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, they definitely should be broken up because the end result is, you know, they're so big now that they literally control, you know, you know, uh, the safety reports. They have their own little nurse station where they take care of us mm -hmm. that literally, you know, they tell us we've had people with broke, broken, uh, you know, limbs where they told, oh, you're, you're fine. You, you just sprained it. Here, wrap it with an ace bandage, and they go back to work with a broken limb. It hurts so bad, they go into the hospital the next day, and they told, they're put in a cast, you know? So stuff like that, it literally just breeds a dangerous environment. So they need to be broken up, and we need to be able to you know, have a say to tell you guys, like, hey, this is, you know, this is an important area to look at, and, hey, they've been doing all of this stuff for the longest, like, for, uh, okay, one of the questions dealt with, okay, have, um, you know, workers been retaliated against? We've had eight people that were terminated for speaking out. That pretty much silenced those warehouses speaking out during a pandemic. So they need to be separated and small enough so that a way, you know, you can look at them individually. And there needs to be accountability. There needs to be some kind of punishment from something because whatever there is now is not doing anything because they're still doing it. They're still doing it and they'll keep doing it. They did it before the pandemic and they're doing it now. So there needs to be some kind of accountability and they have to be broken up so that way they're not so huge, literally controlling the world. Thank you, Courtney. I, I want to thank you for your courage in speaking out, obviously, given, given the retaliation that you've just been talking about. So um, I want to honor that. Uh, Emma. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the only thing I would add to those, those two points, which I think are were really smart, is, um, is that the walkouts that we've seen, not only during the pandemic, but I think they're, as I mentioned, especially impressive then, um, and, uh, and the amount of attention that they've gotten, that doesn't happen without coherent organization. So that's really, that, that's really encouraging. And, um, and then I think that this is all, this is complimentary, but I think that the work that people like Sandeep and, and his colleagues at OMI have been doing have primed the media to, um, to hear, to, to, to understand what they're seeing when they see those workouts, uh, those walkouts and, um, and hear stories like Courtney's. Um, and then I can also tell you that the biggest um, and I think smartest unions in the country are ready to, um, are really excited about, um, about amplifying those voices and, um, and, and supporting those workers. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so there are a lot of questions in the chat around a very common theme of what 
legislation uh, do we need to pass <laughs> to, to, to make sure that uh, we have uh, the, the, the right rules in place to uh, crack down on, on, on monopolization? Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, Sandeep has written for us that uh, uh, at the prospect that the laws, uh, many of them are already on the books and, and, and need just to be targeted and, and re, re imagined re-envisioned and, and uh, implemented in, in such a way that is uh, uh, more appropriate to actually uh, do the job that it was, they were intended to do. So uh, Sandeep, maybe could you talk about, uh, you know, I mean, you mentioned the consumer welfare standard. Uh, obviously, that was guidance. That's not something that's in law. Uh, you don't need legislation necessarily to change that. Um, but, uh, you know, what are, what are some of these ways in which uh, change can happen at, you know, the, the legislative level, uh, whether it needs to be passed affirmatively or just reimagined with the existing laws on the table? Sure. So. I think for certain things, we do need legislation. If we are serious about protecting workers and small firms' right to organize, we do need legislation to safeguard and guarantee that right. But in other things, uh, sort of fair competition and mergers, the DOJ and the FTC actually have a substantial body of good precedent and legal authorities to use. We just need better people in charge at both places. So one concrete example is merger policy. And since the early 1980s, the DOJ and FTC have steadily made it easier for companies to merge by issuing these merger guidelines, which lay out sort of their interpretation of the law. And you know, the courts give them a lot of deference and say, you know, the DOJ and FTC know what they're doing. We will follow the analytical framework laid out in these guidelines. And these guidelines have made it much easier for companies to buy out their rivals, buy out their customers, buy out their suppliers. And new and stronger guidelines would actually go a long way toward reinvigorating merger policy. So in the late 1960s, the DOJ put out merger guidelines that laid out a series of relatively simple market share and market concentration thresholds, which said, if you buy out a rival and as a result have more than X percent of the market, we will sue and stop that merger in court. We should go back to that system of simple rules that put businesses on notice that, you know, most merger and acquisition activity will be heavily restricted. If they want to grow, they should invest in new facilities, new technologies, and hire more workers instead of buying out other companies. So I think mergers are a good example of an area where the law can actually be strengthened in relatively short order. And the FTC can do a lot under its unfair methods of competition authority to restrict unfair and abusive practices by dominant firms, uh, including in labor markets. You know, as I mentioned, the FTC could and should ban non-compete clauses as an unfair method of competition. And I would hope that something like that would attract the interest of a democratic administration. Great, uh, thanks. Um, I have a question, maybe Brian can take this one. Uh, uh, Stephen Varnas asks if there's still mechanisms for private enforcement of antitrust laws, which we know that there are, uh, and to what extent can private litigation play in uh, uh, assisting workers with these uh, tremendous problems that uh, they have in antitrust? I think I might, I might kick that one over to Sandeep after taking a brief stab, brief stab at it, um, but the, I, one of the problems there is that workers are, are uh, antitrust has been weaponized against workers and working people who don't have employee status, uh, independent contractors, um, you know, someone who might own a truck and employ a couple of people. Um, so antitrust has really sort of been weaponized um, against workers. But private litigation is very hard. It's very hard to, for a worker to, for example, I guess, I guess the case would be suing an employer for monopolistic, monopsonistic uh, violations, which is really hard to prove. Workers don't have the resources to undertake that kind of litigation. Um, so, but, so private litigation is usually employed by uh, deployed by uh, you know someone with deeper pockets than than a worker or, or even a union. Um, and yeah. Sandeep, do you want to uh, take a stab at that? Yeah, so private antitrust litigation today is extraordinarily costly, time-consuming, and risky. The Supreme Court has erected a number of obstacles against private enforcement. Maybe the most famous example is the indiscriminate expansion of mandatory arbitration. So using arbitration clauses in consumer contracts and employment contracts, corporations can 
block lawsuits, can block class actions, and can shuttle all legal disputes into private arbitration where a consumer or a worker has to go on her own against a very powerful entity. Uh, but arbitration is really just the tip of the iceberg. There are a number of other uh, sort of procedural rules that favor corporate defendants. Uh, so another good example is it's very hard to get a class action certified. Uh, and, you know, for many corporate offenses, you know, class actions are the only way of holding them accountable because the harm to an individual is often very small, but the aggregate harm is substantial. Uh, so in the absence of class actions, a lot of corporate lawbreaking goes unpunished, unremedied. So uh, just to be a brief glimmer of sunshine there, the, the arbitration issue uh, actually has been an interesting one over the last year in terms of how workers have organized to change that position, particularly around uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. So uh, there were several uh, worker-led walkouts, particularly in Silicon Valley, Valley and also elsewhere that have affirmatively changed policies uh, within large corporations like Microsoft, like Google, uh, and so on, that uh, have have said that okay for for that subset of uh, worker conduct, uh, we will we will not make those subject to a mandatory arbitration. And it seems like a foot in the door. Uh, for more organizing and more action, uh, including among uh, uh, non-union employees who weren't traditionally organized, particularly in Silicon Valley. I think it's a really interesting uh, uh, phenomenon. So um, I, I want to get back to, to misclassification because I think this is, uh, this is a really important thing that Brian touched on. Maybe Emma uh, or, or Andrea can take this. Um, you know, the, the antitrust implications of having all these independent contractors and then, you know, uh, barring them effectively from organizing on their own as an antitrust violation. So if you, if you agglomerate these people into a firm, then the firm can uh, ban those people together almost legally through uh, uh, and, and, and use their dominant market power. But if they're all separate, then those workers themselves cannot band together. Um, uh, you know, is there, uh, uh, what is the, the state of the fight on misclassification? What do you think uh, uh, is, is, can be done and is being done to, to move forward on that significant problem? I know here in California, we've had uh, uh, AB5, with, uh, which is a, 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 a law that's intended to fight misclassification, but maybe you can talk about sort of the state of play. I, yeah, I think um, California, AB5 is certainly um, the most high profile and probably um, uh, most will have the most significant impact of any recent um, effort to, uh, to protect workers in this regard. Um, other states use the ABC test that AB5 imposes where, um, where workers are employees. Um, there's a presumption that a worker is an employee. Um, I, I will say reforms at the state level, while they're laudable and correct, um, they, uh, they're still not, I'm coming at this from a traditional labor law perspective, but um, they're still not because of the, the structure of, the, of both the antitrust and labor laws in our country, they're still not granting these workers affirmative organizing protection. So um, AB5 is significant. Everything that every other state is doing in that regard is significant. Um, but uh, but it, it, has, it has those limits, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we, we are pretty much out of time on this panel, but I, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Andrea Dellendorf with uh, 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 United for Respect, uh, Emma Rebhorn with Change to Win, Courtney Brown, uh, Amazon Worker, uh, Sandeep Bahisan, Open Markets Institute, Brian Kalachi at uh, Data and Society. Uh, I'm David Dan uh, with uh, the American Prospect. Uh, actually I actually have a book on these issues that I'm a very bad self-promoter of uh, that I should mention. Uh, it's called Monopolized Life in the Age of Corporate Power, and it comes out in July. So uh, check out that. Um, anyway, uh, thank you all for attending, and uh, we really appreciate it. And onward. Thank you. Thank you.